Regards to all of you who have contributed to my series of video talks on Jewish mysticism. A special thank you to Endry, my good friend from LA, the City of Angels. And a very kind sincere to the legendary Dr. David Bell, who entered in peace and left in peace. In about 1570, there was a rabbi living in Damascus named Chaim Vital. He had visions in which he was visited by a maggot, a celestial being who teaches the mysteries of God. The maggot told Vital that there'd be a remarkable teacher sent from God living in Safed, a town in the northern reaches of Israel. Vital left Damascus and went to Safed. He found Isaac Loria in Safed, who had already been there and established for four years. Isaac Loria never wrote anything down. He was against people recording his sermons and his teachings. However, Vital recorded Dr. Bell, correction, Vital recorded Loria in secret. Loria died suddenly at the age of 38, and after this, Vital published all of Loria's teachings. Loria is regularly called the Ari, Hebrew word for lion. Ari could also stand for Ashkenazi Rabbi Isaac. According to Chaim Vital, Loria's father was visited numerous times by the prophet Elijah. During Loria's circumcision, his father saw Elijah in the crowd of people watching the circumcision. Loria's father died when Loria was about eight. After his death, they moved to Carol. Loria was a star pupil when it came to studying the Torah. Eventually, he bought a copy of the Zohar from a strange businessman. Loria then proceeded to study the Zohar for the next eight years. He would go out to a remote cabin five days a week and study the Zohar. He has visions of the prophet Elijah while studying in his cabin. Elijah begins to personally educate Loria on the Zohar. Eventually, the long-deceased Rabbi Kiva and Rabbi Simeon ben Yochai begin to personally teach Loria on the Zohar. Because these rabbis were dead for centuries prior to this age and time, we are led to believe that they were present in a non-corporal form, like a hologram or a spirit. Loria's teachings strongly emphasize morals and ethics. He popularizes the idea of rebirth. He says that everything on earth is subject to improvement. Eventually, Elijah tells Loria to move with his family to Safed. They stay in Safed for about six years until Loria's death. Isaac Loria's Kabbalah begins with Ensof. Loria says that there's no way for creation to come directly out of the limitless nothing of Ensof. Loria <clears throat> said that Ensof made a space within itself for creation to occur. This was called Zimzum, which means contraction. It's like someone sucking in their gut, contracting within oneself so as to allow for emptiness. Ensof was called the limitless light. This limitless light starts to pour into this area which was reserved for creation. This light eventually begins to form stuff. The first form is the head of Adam Kodman. Adam here means human, and Kodman represents primordial. Therefore, Adam Kodman, a primordial human. The first step of creation must reflect God's image. Eventually, light keeps pouring in through and forms the first image of God. It's like the shape of a regular androgynous human. The first image of God will be the basic map of the ten sephiroth of the Zohar. God in the Old Testament can appear at times to be very mean and bad. Laurie proposed a completely new and revolutionary idea that something in God's nature isn't entirely good. This badness of God managed to get around the rim of the area in Insaf reserved for creation. It formed something analogous to a sticky residue around the area of creation. This residue was called Reshimu 
We must unite the Reshimu with the limitless light to restore the world. All of the Sephiroth come from the combination of the spheres of the Reshimu and the limitless light. This was possible because Reshimu is much less rarefied than the limitless light. The limitless light is completely beyond our comprehension. But we can understand somewhat Reshimu and thus make it somewhat physically real. Ensof could never take any kind of form, but Reshimu allows there to be some forms. Since Reshimu is a bit imperfect, we are able to make it real. This idea of Reshimu creates the idea that God is, is an endless process. We must reunite God with the Reshimu and restore God to what he should have been at the beginning. In the space reserved for creation, we must imagine that all the ten Sephiroth completely and equally occupied the space. The light and the Reshimu make the Sephiroth somewhat real. Because the light is infinite and constantly flowing, eventually some Sephiroth couldn't contain all the light. The first three Sephiroth were able to hold the light, but all the ones under it could not. The spheres were called Kilim because of the Reshimu. Kilim is a Hebrew word for vessel. The spheres under the top three weren't able to hold the light and they shattered. This is called the breaking of the vessels. They exploded into the sparks of divine light and of Reshimu. These sparks eventually settled in the physical world, Malkuth. This Reshimu in our world is what causes the Yetzir Hara. We experience the Yetzir Hara as a cunning, baffling, and powerful force of self-destruction. It is like a tendency to deny, ignore, or resist that which is good for us. The Yetzir Hara is responsible for the first sin by Adam and Eve, that archetypal breaking off from the pure and good. This is why there is good and evil in the world, unity and enmity, joy and suffering. Such a metaphysical understanding of the cosmos was mind-blowing for its day, and still is in many respects. Even though the Reshimu isn't good, it still needs to exist for us to have a physical world. Evil relies upon goodness for it to exist. Reshimu needs the divine sparks to exist because these divine sparks animate Reshimu. Loria says we must raise the divine sparks from the world's physical matter. We must remove the divine sparks so that the Reshimu can no longer exist. What would happen if we managed to release all the divine sparks? All the evil and wickedness of the world would be extracted. This would yield two major results. Number one, we'd bring about the entire restoration of the universe. Everything would be in its perfect equilibrium with God. This means that everything in the world would become spiritual. No physical matter would exist no more. And number two, we would restore God to his perfect state. The 613 mitzvah are essential, but half of the 613 mitzvah cannot be fulfilled since they are concerned with the sacrificial system performed in the Jerusalem temple, which no longer exists. A modern Lurianic Kabbalist might say that the mitzvah that can no longer be performed are to be fulfilled in a spiritual sense. So how do the whole of the Jewish people release sparks? Every time you fulfill a mitzvah, you release a divine spark. Every time you dis disobey a commandment, you return a release spark into the world and imprison it. There are certain laws which anyone can complete. Even animals have the ability to release sparks. But the full ability to restore the world is the responsibility of the Jewish people. Loria wished to speed this process up for his adherents. He had a specific way of doing this. We only know from Chaim Vital what these teachings were. 
there were two important parts to the Aries way of speeding up the restoration of the universe. Number one, mindfulness. You had to be completely self-aware at every moment of your life. You had to know exactly what you were doing at all times. You had to practice this constantly. Only if you were mindful all the time, you won't disobey a commandment. You can't do this all the time, but you must practice it all the same. It was hard to know Loria's specific teachings because they differed per individual. Loria was a spiritual guide. The other way to help speed up the restoration of the universe was through letters and words. These were again made very important. Loria rewrote some hymns and prayers to include specific words that would stimulate the Sephiroth within our bodies. The Ari knew how to help start his disciples climbing the spheres. He would give each disciple an individual mantra, a word or phrase to meditate on. They would have to completely absorb the mantra, and this would help the disciples climb the tree of life much faster. If you can climb the tree of life, then you can achieve the Kabbalah you could, and then you completely done your part in restoring the universe. If at any one given moment all the people of Israel fulfill a commandment, then the world would be restored. This hasn't happened yet. As Loria was well aware, the Reshimu exist everywhere, not just in this world. Each sphere had its own Setra Akra, a dark side. The disciples had trouble coping with the Sitra Akra. It made it difficult to practice mindfulness. Loria provided different kinds of mantras to overcome the Sitra Akra. They were formulas to induce sounds and scents, as in paramystical phenomena. This fast track method lasted up until Vital's death. Mm -hmm.